Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of What Makes You Click. I'm really pleased to have as my guest today, Zazie Todd. Zazie will probably be known to lots of you. If you don't know her blog site, uh, then uh, please do check it out. We'll obviously be talking about that amongst other things. Um, but Zazie has this great blog where she talks about um, pet related issues. Um, she's also published the book, uh, wag which is a lovely read and i'm going to talk about that and there is the cat equivalent per coming out next year um and zazie's got an interesting background because she's a psychologist uh first and foremost and has sort of moved into this area but is a real leader in an inspiration in sort of public communication of science and that's what i really like about you know it's very easy for the media to get hold of things and um completely change the meaning of it um, so I'm really pleased to have somebody who knows how to do public communication unlike me I just do these as a bit of fun to catch up with people that I'm interested in and that people I find inspirational and as I said I've got a true uh, pro here in regards to public communication so um, and neither of us have got a glass of wine tonight because uh, Zazie is in Vancouver. Yeah. And I'm in the UK and it's still quite early, but we have, yeah, I have my water. Cup of tea. Uh, so, so thank you for joining us. Uh, it's, I'm really pleased that you've been able to um, sort of find the time. And I, I guess sort of the first question is sort of how did you end up doing, um, you know, well, companionanimalpsychology.com, which is your uh, website. And, um, you know, yeah, what dragged you into that field of working in the public communication? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to come and chat with you, because it's a real pleasure to chat with you, um, especially knowing so much, having read so much of your research over the years. Um, so that's a real thrill for me. And really, I started Companion Animal Psychology for a couple of reasons. One is that I was inspired by my own pets, because at that time I had two dogs, Ghost and Bodger. Ghost was a uh, very, very, very large Siberian Husky Alaska Malamute cross. People were always asking us, is he a wolf? Because he was that big. <laughs> um, and Bodger, my Australian Shepherd, and both of them I write about in the book as well. And I wanted to know more about them and how to help them because with my background in psychology, I used to look at things that were said about dog training. And I used to look at things that you could see on TV and think, uh oh, this is just weird. This doesn't match with, you know, the background of what I know or how we would deal with people. And OK, animals aren't people, but still we want to be humane in the way that we treat them. So that was one reason. Um, and the other was that I read John Bradshaw's book, um, Dog Sense, which is in defense of dogs in the UK. And I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And a very, very long time ago, back when I was doing my PhD, I had kind of thought, well, it would be nice to do something on cats, but it wasn't really an option. Psychologists weren't interested at all in domestic animals. Um, so I thought, well, maybe this is my chance to actually do something about dogs and cats. And so I started writing Companion Animal Psychology. I did not know if I was going to keep it up. I just thought I'll try it and see what happens. And then it's quite amazing what it's turned into <laughs> and the fact that it's turned into a book and, uh, you know, so many other things as well so it's been fun along the way too a little bit like my academic career i had no idea that what i was going to get getting into but here i am still um i think one of the things which one of the things that strikes me about the book and you know not only you, you do a remarkable job in taking science and making it very digestible um for people and using the points to illustrate you know that this isn't just an, an opinion but the thing that really Right, when you've mentioned both Ghost and Bodger already, and I thought they'd come up fairly soon. <laughs> they obviously <laughs> such an important part. But it is, you know, the book is, it is a story about your, yeah, your experience with your dogs as well. You know, there's that very personal part to it, which I think is, it makes it very endearing. It makes it, it's a, I love books that, um, yeah, sort of A, speak to me. But equally, it's divided into nice short sections as well. So you can just take a bit. Um, I tend to do sort of a lot of this sort of reading late at night or whatever. And when I'm tired, I want to be able to put it down. And if you've got long chapters, it doesn't work. 
and you, you you have this very personal yeah sort of relationship and it's clear you know anyone who reads this is that you know yeah, how much you love your dogs and but I think the great thing is you love your dogs and you want to do right by them and and this is you know this is what got me into companion animals is that I saw lots of people who loved their dogs but unfortunately didn't do right by them yeah. and I think most people want to do right by their dog but they don't necessarily know what to do yeah. they don't know what is doing right and unfortunately a lot of things you look at they tell you completely erroneous information like it's probably more so here than, than where you're based but they will say things that are totally wrong like you shouldn't let your dog on the bed you shouldn't let your dog on the settee well, we still have you shouldn't too. let the dog people still say these things and sometimes people say to me oh my dog has this behavior problem and I'm feeling really guilty is it because I let them come and cuddle on the settee with me and no of course it's not these are personal choices that that people make so and that upsets me because I think people should be able to make these choices and at the same time I think people are, are looking for good information they want to know how to do right by their dog and there's so much misinformation out there and I guess in part I wanted to put something out there that would help people understand what they should do and take them right through from even before they choose their puppy or or shelter dog right through all the way to the end of life so all those different stages of a dog's life and ways things a dog has to do like going to the vet and so on and that's that, that's the thing which you know for so long welfare work generally has been dominated by making sure the animal isn't suffering and again your whole perspective is all as i said it's not about preventing suffering it's actually yeah you, you call it the science of making your dog happy and it's only sort of fairly recently that actually science has really started to look at the issue of positive emotions and things like that and is the animal actually um happy and it always struck me as strange that you know people say oh it's anthropomorphic to talk about happiness of course it's not it's, you know it serves a really important biological purpose being happy and content and that's what we're striving for is not just preventing the animal from suffering yeah, yeah absolutely and i think for so long people haven't really given animals the credit that they do for the things that they might feel or the things that they might be able to think and people have just thought humans are so far ahead of other animals and they've not seen the need to treat other animals with kindness or whatever or to think about their happiness and so when writing the book I was especially influenced by the work of Professor David Meller and the five domains model of animal welfare which says that you have to think about positive experiences as well as the negative ones it's not enough to minimize the negative experience animals actually have to have a life worth living and they need to not just survive but actually thrive as as he puts it and so I've used that throughout the book and I think it's a message that people can really get behind because we care about our dogs and we want them to be happy we don't just want them to be not miserable that's not a very good state of affairs so you know I think people want to know what they can do to make their dog happy and also it's beneficial to them because if they provide what their dog needs then their dog is less likely to have behavior problems mm. um, which of course is something that you know a lot about but yeah. you know I think it helps people right from the get-go if they know what to do yeah and I think you know that that's a good point that you know welfare well a lot of the welfare work was driven originally by Ruth Harrison stuff on you know animal machines um and that led to the five freedoms but you know that was the 1960s and as you mentioned david meller's stuff the five domains has really started to take hold and what is what's interesting i think in fact just before this meeting i was at a, another meeting i was saying a similar sort of thing that um you know that th th those freedoms were sort of free a lot of them were freedoms from and freedom from mm -hmm. bad things which is uh as i said in itself and interesting that did lay the basis for animal welfare legislation internationally and you know absolutely it's been really important but recently in the uk we've moved away from in effect animals having rights i.e., rights to freedom from this that and the other to an emphasis on needs and the responsibility so our you know our welfare codes have in recent years changed to say that as an owner you have a responsibility as the carer even if you're not the owner you have the responsibility for this and i think that feeds very much into david meller's stuff and if um, people are not familiar with the five domains i'll try and remember to put a link up in association with this because yeah 
it, it's that sort of shift in thinking. And I, I like the fact you say, yeah, people can get behind that because I think that is the key thing. The, the paper that you wrote in 2018, um, I've got a copy of it here because I did read it in preparation again, um, barriers to the adoption of humane dog training methods. And as I said, I, I reread it the other night and I, I don't know where my mind has been because I'm, I'm sure I read it two years ago. Um, but it made, it didn't make so much more, it made a sort of big impact on me. The focus on, yeah, sort of, I don't know, the first time I read it, I missed this point that punishment is easy to sell because it has that instant impact. Whereas reinforcement training is part of a journey. And I, I, I think I missed that the first time I read it. And then when I read it again, and said the other night, I was thinking, yeah, that's why it goes on TV, I think, that, you know, some of the more aversive stuff because it looks spectacular and the animal stops and quite apart from what the animal is feeling at the time and what the long-term consequences of this are whether or not it's actually solving the problem that's irrelevant because that's not what the media are about and trying to get the culture right um you know so that people are more open to yeah a much more positive way of doing things um and i just thought yeah it just sort of well as i said I've, I've not really seen it articulated like that and i just I just fascinated to know your thoughts about how can we change the norm to that more positive view i mean yeah i mean i think the good news is that i think the norm is changing uh at different paces depending where you are but things are changing it certainly to me it feels like things are changing uh, where I live I see far fewer people using shock collars than five years ago definitely than 10 years ago um, so things are changing but as you say it's it takes time to make changes using positive reinforcement if your dog has a behavior problem um, it can also feel very difficult for people people can need a lot of support actually to get through that journey of learning what to do to solve the problem um, to make it not an issue anymore to, to help the dog behave better to help the dog feel happier because often fear might, might be underneath it and so there's a whole host of things that that can make a difference and I think banning shock collars would make a big difference. I really hope that the UK government will, will move ahead with that. I don't think that's going to happen here anytime soon, but it makes a difference to people to, just in terms of how they think about something, to know that this is not actually allowed, that, there, that there's a reason for it. It does make people think twice about using it, even to think that it's not allowed somewhere else makes people think twice about using it. But I think like position statements from uh, organizations make a difference. The ways that we see other people training make a difference. Um, it doesn't actually take very much, even just like one person saying, no, you don't use shock collars, you can do it this way instead, can make a big difference because it gives someone the permission to go ahead and try it that way, or they can see that someone else is doing things that way. So I think there's a whole host of things that can make a change. But the more times we see people using positive methods, using positive reinforcement, or doing the right things by their dog, the, the more influential it is, it kind of helps to add up. And it is important to debunk some of the things that people say. Um, it drives me nuts when people say that you can't debunk messages, but you have to know how to go about doing it because it's very easy to accidentally give prominence to those messages that you really want to be getting rid of instead. So you have to know what you're doing and you have to be quite careful about it. And I think it's it's difficult, especially in today's world, you put something on social media if you're lucky or unlucky it can be everywhere in no time you know you have to think quite carefully about what you're doing and what you're saying because it can potentially influence a lot of people but that gives us the opportunity to actually put a lot of good information out there get a lot of good information to people and it's one of the things I'm trying to do with my blog all the time is use principle, good principles of science communication in terms of writing about science and writing about what you can do for your dog or your cat to help them be happier and have good welfare. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's. I, I mean, I, I take your point because I, I find it difficult with you know when people often say sort of you really ought to say something about this TV program that was on last night, and I'm thinking I, I, I've tended, I don't know, rightly or wrongly, in recent years, more often with TV programs, I've tended to think of it a little bit like you know the fish and chip paper. It's it's going to be 
you know yesterday's news and just wrapping up something very greasy and people will forget and if you if you if you're not careful as i say you're just going to raise an issue and you know people are just going to make their statements we're not going to have a meaningful debate um and i think that's what's lacking in this that uh, you know there's not an there are very few forum where a people come together and actually discuss it um and you may or may not know i've uh, sort of in recent months uh, together with some of my colleagues at lincoln we've um been the subject of some interesting uh, maneuverings by lobbyists because we've done this work which suggested that there was no practical benefit from the use of using um, e-collars in dogs and we, we decided you know with the welfare work that had been done people were picking holes and it's saying oh but that sign could mean this well actually under you've got to understand the totality when you're assessing behavior so just cherry picking isn't very useful so we went for the angle of well let's look at efficacy because that you can measure much more objectively and you know the legislation says you shouldn't cause unnecessary suffering and actually i'm not somebody um, you know who says oh we, these things should be matters of last resort um and if, if you need to use it you need to use it the question is do you need to use it <laughs> you know because actually delaying treatment is actually prolonging the suffering of the animal so what we need is an intelligent debate that says are these things necessary so we took the most common indication, which was um, chasing sheep that was used to justify it. And we we worked with the industry to build up the protocol um, and they provided the trainers and they did the training with the e-collars and they did uh, training without the e-collars. And then we not got another group of individuals who didn't use e-collars to do the um, training. And we looked at efficacy. Um, and you know when it looked when we looked at the measures of efficacy and distractibility there was either no difference or they were in favor of the reward based training now interestingly the industry suddenly seemed to say that we don't like that bit of research seeing they were fully engaged oh there's these problems with the design well actually you were engaged in that design and you can pick holes in any piece of science. And one of the things I, I try to get through to my students is there is a difference between criticizing and critiquing. And it's interesting because the lobbyists, uh, and believe it or not, they've been contacting the uh, vice chancellor of the university saying, you should have a statement about this. This is poor quality science or you know, saying all sorts of stuff, trying to get them involved. And the university's attitude has been, we're not gonna engage with this because as soon as they've got something then, you know, it, it prolongs the story. They've got something to, to work with, where saying nothing is, is the best um, situation there. And yeah, so, you know, they've asked me sort of, well, this person says this. Well, actually, you know, anyone can criticize. That doesn't mean that it's a fatal flaw. Critiquing means appreciating the context in which it's done and not just nitpicking on individuals. Um, I don't think there is the perfect experiment, you know? <laughs> I, I agree that there is no such thing as as a perfect experiment. We keep on learning. There's always choices that we make about which way to do something. And one of the things that I liked about the way you did that study is that you had all of the dogs wear a collar that was either a shock collar or it was an inactivated shock collar. But the people who were looking at the dog's behavior couldn't tell if the dog was actually wearing an activated electronic collar or not, for example. And that's a choice you made that I think was an important choice, um, really, yeah. to give and people confidence in the results. The difficulty is, though, even when you do that, it becomes pretty obvious when a dog literally jumps in the air suddenly. Yes. <laughs> and again, you know, people uh, and it's, it's very difficult because obviously the data are subject to confidentiality. Uh, we can we can give people our spreadsheets and they can look at the analysis, but we can't just give the videos to anyone. But anyone looking at some of the dogs being trained in certain ways, I think would be who has a mind of concern, you know, of animal welfare would be concerned about some of the stuff that's going on. Um, and again, you know, it's just sort of, yeah, when 
you said that well sometimes we do need to take things on and i've said well you know in recent years i've tended to not try to do that you know where, what have you got any thoughts as to the best way forward to yeah to move things on increase the momentum rather than just sort of the osmosis and <laughs> diffusion that people like yourself, I think are doing a great job at, at doing. Is there more that we can be doing? Well, first of all, I think you're absolutely right that sometimes we shouldn't take things on because sometimes taking things on is just giving publicity to people who we don't want to give publicity to. And um, we've all heard the saying, all publicity is good publicity. They're not going to care that you're complaining about them. They're going to think, yeah, I'm in the news. Um, so we have to be careful in what we take on but I think what we need to do is keep putting forward positive messages about what people should be doing and try and get those things in the news or in the books and the magazines and so on so that those are the things that people are talking about um, kind of pushing the other stuff to the side drowning it out to some extent but also we know from science communication that positive messages are actually quite likely to get across to people they're not necessarily going to be the messages that get hundreds of thousands of shares on on Facebook because I think Facebook algorithms particularly or some social media algorithms anyway seem to like negative things and people seem to like sharing negative things but it's the positive messages that make a difference to what people do and how people feel about things and so even for individual dog trainers sharing video of using positive reinforcement to train a dog one thing or, or another thing, it makes a difference. All of those messages getting out there makes a difference. And I think the totality of it is important. At the same time, I think things like position statements. So AVSAB has a great set of position statements. They've got a new position statement on punishment, which an updated version coming very soon. And I think things like that do make a difference because they give people something to share with their friends or colleagues to say, look, this is what this organization says about how we should be doing things. And I think that can be influential. And that's one of the things that I mentioned in that 2018 paper as well. So it, it helps to shift the social norms and the ideas about what we should be doing. I think, I mean, it's interesting that in the States, is it PetSmart who've said we're no longer going to sell these collars? Uh, and I think it's a great decision and, and it yeah. got a lot of publicity that, um, you know, and there's, there are actually a lot of people who support that decision and the, the other thing is that sometimes when people come to me and they say that they have tried a trainer who uses a shock collar or even some other kind of aversive method often what they say to me is they didn't really want to but they'll say the trainer persuaded them and so I think better regulation of trainers would also make a difference because at least what people because I have a blog post about how to choose a dog trainer and that means that sometimes people write to me and they say thank you for this post because I've been to this trainer who did such and such and I'm like it's something terrible and this other trainer who said do this instead and that also was something terrible and I'm like why why do people's dogs have to put up with this I think you're, you're, you're probably right that is perhaps the single biggest thing that we can do is pushing for regulation of training uh, in, in that uh, area because yeah it's often in yeah managing problem behavior when you talk about that you don't have to pin your dog down um, you know because this isn't just about shock collars and to me actually well shock collars are quite a small part although when you look at the stuff that uh, the Bristol group turned out we were surprised because this was all part of the same DEFRA funded project just how prevalent shock collars are still in the UK you know because mm -hmm. you think well a lot of people we know are sharing a collar so it's not just about sales you know you can for everyone that's sold you can probably multiply by about five the number of dogs that have had it imposed on um, so, you know, I, I was I was surprised by those data when um, they did that um, survey. But yeah, it's the regulation of training. And again, it's another point that you make um, in the paper is this issue of actually people are selling themselves, you know, even if they use quite punitive methods, they're selling it as if it's a positive experience. Um, but yeah, what I was going to say, actually, though, was dealing with problem behavior. When you tell people, yeah, you don't have to pin your dog down or dominate your dog and it's okay to have your dog on the bed you can literally see the weight go off their shoulders oh you know I can have the relationship that I want with my dog or cat without it necessarily being a problem they think that there is this immediate association that you know if my dog gets on the bed he will be ripping my face off or my child's face off within a month you know and you think no that's not the situation. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, I think it's a big relief for people. And also, I think it's more fun to be training if you're using food rewards for training. That is a lot of fun, um, you know, and you see how much your dog is enjoying it. And I think people can really get hooked on that as well. And, you know, I don't want to make it sound like more people are using aversive methods than, than actually are. I do think there has been a huge change towards using positive reward based methods and using food in training and you know obviously that that's a really great thing but I think when you talk to people about problem behaviors often they will have been led to try aversive methods first because someone will have told them that's what they should do so perhaps we're slightly biased to seeing more people who, who do that as well. But that's also one of the things that I try and do in the clinic is and we call them problem behaviors because they are problems for the owners. But and I one of the things I try to get across to them early on in the consultation is let's, you know, let's sort of we recognize that there is a problem here, but let's focus on what a great opportunity you've got to learn about your dog now, you know, because your dog does this. You know, it can be you can think of it as a challenge which you can rise up to, but also you can look, you know, yes, you've had five other dogs and they've all been perfect but how much did you get to know them as a result here you've got a dog that you really have to get to know and you know here's a great opportunity you can have lots of fun yeah we can have lots of fun sorting this out and actually you can have a better relationship than you had with the previous five dogs who caused no problems whatsoever you know and trying to turn things around from that negative to a positive um you know clients sometimes say oh well you know if it's gonna is it gonna take that length of time? You think, well, we could do it sooner, but you're gonna to have to do more work. So which do you want? You know, there's there's a trade-off here. You can have fun doing it, but if you really get into it, yeah, we can we can move quicker. But you know, we're just trying to make it as easy as possible. Um, I had a uh, a PhD student a few years ago, and um, she was looking at the uh, human dog bond. And um, when I was at vet school we were taught you know there's lots of dogs in rescue centers because people don't think before they get a dog they don't realize how much it's going to cost and as a vet it's your job to make sure people are aware of the financial responsibility they're taking on now i first graduated and then worked for the pdsa which is a charity that does free care um so money was not an issue but what occurred to me was you know actually you know this this was completely completely the wrong thing that they were teaching us. People often will make enormous personal sacrifices financially for their pets. What they are struggling with is the balance of the time they need to give their dog to resolve the problem over the time that they've got available. And, you know, actually, you know, what vets need to come out is not telling people about this is the responsibility that you're taking on financially. Yes, people need to be aware of that. But having a good relationship, this is what a good relationship looks like. And, you know, there will be times, every, every relationship we have challenges every now and again, and you're going to need to give up some time to sort that out. But what Claire did, which was really quite um, smart, is we started to ask people, you know, how much time they spent doing various dog activities. So typically walking, uh, grooming their dog, you know, washing up food bowls, preparing meals, and, you know, assuming that they had an eight hour day, how much time? And on the basis of that, I came up with this rule of thumb that when it comes to managing problem behavior, if you ask somebody to give up more than 10 minutes in the day to solve the problem, you're probably asking them to do too much. They simply don't have the time. So what we've got to try and do is make sure that most of the advice we are giving is fully embedded in their normal routines. Uh, you know, I came out of vet school telling, telling people, yeah, you've got to do this desensitization and counter conditioning program to sort this animal out. A, it's incredibly difficult. I don't know if you've ever had to <laughs> yes. implement it fully. You know, it, it, it takes a lot of skill. It's very, uh, it's very time consuming. Um, you know, and it's, it's not easy. And most people just haven't got the time to do that. Um, so we spend a lot of time thinking about well, what do you do and how can we manage the situations? And yeah, we will get the animal. We're not going to leave the animal scared. This is why we, you know, we developed the, the sort of the ideas behind the safe haven. 
that actually it's far easier to train the animal away from the problem situation, teach it that it feels safe and secure, then actually when there are some of these noises, it's, you know, it's not stressed and therefore you're dealing with a much more minor issue. Just as important as a physical safe haven is having the owner as a secure base. And to me, that's why punitive methods, you know, quite apart from any argument about their, you know, just in general, how can your dog know that he's safe and secure with you if some of the time you lash out at him? You know, that's not rocket science. You know, and, and I think owners really get that, um, you know, and that's that's a vehicle that and I've started using a term sensitive carer. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah that's nice. but, because it looks it, it builds on the, the stuff about, uh, you know, with the attachment and the bond that an infant has with their carer is different to the bond that a carer has with the infant. But actually, the, the caring style has an enormous impact on how that infant will develop. And what we know, and it was really brought home to me by a conference I was at, and there was somebody um, who was working in the field of postnatal depression in women. And it was one of the saddest things I have ever seen, you know. And it was basically these mothers and, you know, no, and no fault of their own they could not respond to their child you know there were no smiles or anything and you just thought you know a that was desperately sad but also you know the child still want you know and those mothers love their children as much as any mother could in that situation but the child was getting no feedback and so you know that is such a big risk factor for all sorts of life chances for that child you know and it's desperately sad um and the, the uh, presenter also made the point, and we were chatting about this afterwards, that now we've got people waiting at the school gate and they're just on their smartphones. And actually, you know, the person's face, and I'll, you, I'm, I'm not criticizing mothers, but you know, it usually is the mother that's there, yeah? Those mothers' faces are, to me, look like mothers, you know, almost like mothers with postnatal depression because they're so absorbed oh, in the screen. <laughs> They're not giving mm. any feedback to their child who's in the push chair while they're waiting for the child out of school. Mm. And, you know, so we've got, we've potentially got a time bomb there. I know we're here to talk about cats and dogs, but, um, but the key thing is that in order for the child to develop, yeah, the child needs feedback and the facial expressions are so important. And uh, as mm. you know, part of my and, work. Um, with infants, we call it serve and return, don't we? So the child, yeah. the baby, when it's a baby, they'll, they'll do something and, and they need they need their caregiver whether it's the mother or the father or whoever happens to be looking after them to respond to that and and return kind of return it and it, it's like a, a dance between them really and it's so important for the development of the infant's um, neural system really how their stress response is going to develop and it makes such a difference to them when they're older and then so that's why we use attachment as you say now when we're talking about pets as well because we want to think of being a safe haven and a secure base for a dog or a cat because it can help them with with so many future things so i th i think that's a really important point and that sounds oh, like a very sad conference. Do you something in return hang on like serve something. serve and return I'm serve gonna, and I, return okay so I've yeah. got my, yeah, <laughs> serve and return that's going to be another of my buzz phrases because again that's a simple message and i said i call it the sensitive carer because basically you know the, an example of where the, it goes wrong and this is where we tend to use it uh, is you know the dog is scared and you know the owner's been given the advice well you shouldn't console the dog because you'll reinforce it and they've been given the advice uh, to ignore the, the dog and neither of those work the, the first problem is you know well if you do try to console the dog the problem is not that you're reinforcing the behavior by providing some positive reinforcement for it I don't think that happens the animal is scared problem is if you crouch down with that dog and try to console it from a dog's perspective you look like you're scared mm. and you lose the, the, the problem is the dog is scared and it's looking for some direction how should I respond to this situation so the problem with the advice of you know try to console the animal is that actually you can be misunderstood 
The problem with ignoring the animal is the animal is looking for some direction and you're making no acknowledgement. You're like the postnatal depression mother. So in both of those situations, we're not being very helpful. The idea of the sensitive carer, it, it's simple, as I said, a simple uh, rule, but a, a serve, and re serve and return, I'm gonna remember. <laughs> of course. Um, but, you know, you acknowledge that the dog is scared. You orientate to the dog when he's scared and you say, oh, it's scary. I can see you're scared. Then you model that there is nothing to be scared about. Now, that doesn't mean you shove a toy in the dog's face, because the last thing you want you know, <laughs> when you're scared is somebody shoving something and imposing on you. But you create an ambience to show that this is not an environment that I am worried about. I have acknowledged that you are scared. And I think of it like, you know, kids naturally grow up scared of thunderstorms. But at some point, parents or friends sit with a thunderstorm and you watch it out the window and say, isn't this fun? Isn't it amazing? You know, here we are safe at home. And that's when you get that transition, that everything is OK. Now, unfortunately, the dog doesn't know that the next clap of thunder isn't going to occur in the room. Mm. But acknowledging the dog's fear and concern and then modeling that actually because I have a good relationship with you and I am your secure base and I am juggling really badly with these things which happen to be your toys and they're going all over the place you now read that actually you've acknowledged my behavior but it's okay mm. and that is so much easier than doing systematic desensitization and counter conditioning <laughs> And, you know, we, we fix cases just doing those sorts of activities, wow. some of the fears. And it's so much easier for owners mm. to get to it because also they can have fun. You know, it's how mm. most clients I end up saying to them, if you've got a pet dog, I know you've got a sense of humor. So, you know, let's have some fun. <laughs> let's have some fun doing this. Mm. Um, and, you know, that idea of yeah demonstrating. And so you build the right relationship. So we can't, the dog has to know that it's safe with you therefore what you do will have such an enormous influence and you can turn things around so much more easily that way I think mm, yeah I think the relationship matters such a lot I'm I am a big fan of counter conditioning I think that makes a big difference but I think desensitization is really really hard for people to get right and yeah. I I actually have an example in WAG of when I was trying to do that with Bodger and I got it totally totally wrong because he was terrified of owls and some years we would have an owl nesting in our backyard so there would be a lot of owl sounds <laughs> and whenever the owl hooted he would just go absolutely crazy he was really quite concerned by it um, one year he actually chased the owl away all the way up the street like he ran off at, at night in the dark after this owl he was unleashed but he managed to get away and I, I eventually found him at the top of the street outside someone's gate and the owl was inside the gate up a tree and he was there barking at it but anyway most he was actually really concerned by that by the owl and so I tried to do some desensitization I thought I can get this noise on my computer and I can play it really quiet and I can give him a treat and teach him that he can just be perfectly happy while the owl is hooting away but I obviously I played it too loud you know which is very very easy to do I think it's so easy to get desensitization wrong and he was in another part of the house I had tried to make sure that he wasn't going to be disturbed by it but he came running in like where's this owl in your study <laughs> you know what's going on and and I felt really really bad about it and um but it was quite difficult because if the owl hoots in the middle of the night and he's barking or you know making a big fuss it's actually was quite hard to deal with because you want to be asleep you don't want to have to be you know dealing with a the problem there but we did get him used to the owl so you know in in the end it oh yeah i mean it, it helps it, it works absolutely and and you're right counter conditioning is easier if you use the operant sort of well even well use respondent as well if it works mm. If you can find something that the dog just wants to focus on, then uh, use that as a distraction. Um, but yeah, when people use the uh, recordings, you say often we, we get it wrong with the right threshold. Sometimes it doesn't translate from the recording to the real world situation as well. So you think you've cracked it. And then unfortunately, that isn't the case. Um, one of the things that I I've sort of felt increasingly, though, is, you know, Desensitization counter conditioning works well if it can be done. And as I said, there's a, there's a, there's a big practical um, issue there um, for fears and anxieties. But I personally am not convinced it's as effective when it comes to frustration type issues. And 
you know, since sort of you get this impression when you're seeing the cases and looking at clients and you obviously we have the advantage that most of the cases we've seen have been to other people so they've been and often they've been given quite good advice and it's just not work so therefore we can discount whatever um, there was and people have said oh well the dog is anxious well actually it's frustrated and you know they've been given exercises to try and help the animal um, desensitize the counter condition and you actually think no, I, th I think it's far better that the animal, for frustration, it's often a lot better if you can just keep the animal distracted and actually get its brain to process that there are these other things going on, but this other thing is more important. Um, and so it's been exposed in a, in a way, and you could say it is desensitization from a, a sort of, um, but actually you're not drawing any attention to it. You are keeping the animal focused and, you know, our brains do so much unconscious processing of other things that are going on and you can make better progress that way than actually doing a head on. Let's get it. Let's, let's stop it getting so aroused at this thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And you think, yeah, that's, that's really tough, I think. And it's an area that I'm hoping to do more work in to start explore new methods um i don't know is your knowledge from the human field if you've got any, what people do a lot with um, kids with frustration issues how they address them successfully or not well the thing with dogs of course is that people think that once you've trained them some kind of some kind of behavior that helps to deal with a different kind of frustration that it will help in in different situations but i, I would love to see some research on that i think that would be fascinating and can i go back to something you said earlier because yeah. earlier on you said something that I really loved about how hard it is for people to work with a pet when they're when their pet has a behavior issue and how little time people have that's available and I think it's really important to be able to support people through that really carefully because it's easy to give people too much information and too much to do all at once and they have to be able to fit it into their life and if you look at there's been a couple of papers that look at the emotional impact on on the dog's guardian when the dog has a behavior issue um so there's been the work from bristol from um emma williams and emily blackwell and then there's been the research by buller and ballantyne as well about how people feel about their dog's behavior issues and emotionally for a person it can be feel really difficult and they have a whole range of negative emotions and and i think one of so the things that you said about seeing it as a challenge and turning it into something fun really make a difference and help people to get to deal with some of those negative emotions because it feels embarrassing it feels difficult you feel like you've let your dog down um you know all of those negative emotions you feel like people are judging you for it and and so on and and it makes it more difficult to deal with the issue because you have all these negative emotions to process as well so there was a study um i think it was is it I think it's an Italian group that did it originally, and it was it's a relatively small sample, but it was quite interesting because they looked at the emotional load of having an animal with cardiac issues, cancer, behavioral problems. And yeah, you know, the behavioral problems emotionally are so draining, you know? Um, and I think that, and that makes sense, really, because potentially you, you're going to feel like it's your fault or at least that other people are going to think it's your fault whereas if your dog's got cancer or cardiac problems it's clearly not your fault it's just something that happens in life you know and we feel responsible for for our pet's behavior so that makes it kind of more difficult because we're we're judging ourselves or we feel that we're being judged hmm. so you meant well you mentioned about the generalization and uh, and i agree with you we need more work on how um how much generalization occurs in, in the learning. And it's something which I've been interested in from both points of view. So we, we did work where, you know, we, we trained animals and then we moved them into another room and just changing the room and you look at the decline in, in performance. And so with simple obedience, it is so often very context specific. Um, and that's why the dog is brilliant on a Thursday night in the village hall, but as soon as the dog goes home, you know the owner just thinks he's, he's forgotten everything no it's a different environment you just have to remember that but if you stick with it it will you'll catch up much quicker you know you go to the village hall to learn the tools and we, we've talked about this actually in our group sort of 
you know, the ideal dog training classes actually probably wouldn't have very many dogs in them because they're <laughs> teaching people the tools that they then go home and apply there rather than think that they're doing it all in the hall, um, the village hall or wherever they're um, training their dogs. But one um, of our former master's students, Sean Ryan, we, she looked at the issue of um, impulsivity and in that situation, what we looked at was teaching dogs to delay reward gratification in a range of contexts. Um, so, you know, and when people sometimes do the impulsivity work, some of the stuff that people have done, I don't think is in, they call them impulse control exercises. But to me, an impulse control exercise, one of the key features about it is it is not cued by the owner because if it is cued by the owner, they're just following an instruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The whole point is the animal learns to self-control. So you wait until the animal is calm before you open the door, let it out of the boot of the car, you know, um, its food goes down. And she looked at doing this, um, and we, we never published the work because there, there was a slight confound, which I don't think was significant, but it would have meant putting in another control group. Um, and she, she exposed people to this. And then we looked at the dog's responses on a delayed reward task in a laboratory setting. And sure mm -hmm. enough, as they improved in these other tasks, so they could um, delay reward in the experimental paradigm, which was, which was very different to the environmental context. So certainly some skills can do this, but I think the difference with obedience work uh, and the instruction is that it's very specific bits of information and the mm. dog reads that in a very particular location whereas you know the work we do on psychometrics and the behavioral traits is rooting much more in the biology and that's why we're interested in it it's those behavioral tendencies as opposed to those behavioral acts that mm. we're trying to shape so you know I know myself I'm very impulsive and you know, unfortunately, I've been in a safe environment most of my life. That said, I've nearly, that said, I've nearly killed myself in multiple occasions. Oh dear. Uh, <laughs> poor decision making, crossing the road, got run over, nearly oh dear. jumped into a pool, nearly drowned. Uh, I thought right. I it, it, was, it ended up it was a whirlpool and got oh thrown against the side, clambered out and thought that was stupid. Better be careful next time and jump straight back in again. So that was twice in, in five <laughs> minutes I nearly made. But, you were in shock and didn't take time to think you know, in the wrong environment yeah you know I wouldn't um I wouldn't be here if you're in a safe environment being impulsive can actually mean that you quickly make decisions that can be advantageous those same traits in the wrong environment can be absolutely fatal but you know you can do things to reduce your impulsivity um as a trait but as I said, learning specific exercises seem to be very, very context specific. Um, you know, you, the dog learns it in that room or the dog learns it with that person. Um, mm. And they do connect similarities between words. Many years ago, uh, Adam and I ran a, a weekend course where we got people to do the do as I do mm. um, uh, program. And we looked at variants on it. And one of the things was that the, those people who don't know what do as I do is, you basically demonstrate the behavior and the dog does the doggy version of it. And so it's a way of quickly building up a behavioral repertoire. Um, and um, there's an interesting chat, if people are interested in this, uh, with, I have with Jean Donaldson on one of the podcasts, because she's not convinced that we've put all the controls and I think she's probably right, but exactly mm. what's going on in the dog's brain, we're not sure. But one of the things that we looked at was if you wanted the dog to basically respond to more than one handler, it seemed from the population that we had, that has to be introduced quite early on. Mm. So if you always do this for your dog um, and then I come along, it won't accept, it won't, even though I say do as I do and if you say do you know do it I go do it it won't the dog won't do it <laughs> yeah, and they, yeah. Need, they need that experience because yeah they're modeling on a yeah 
they need that generalization very early on in the process. Um, mm, that's really interesting. And I heard your chat with Jean. I thought that was that was wonderful. And as you know, I studied at the Academy for Dog Trainers with Jean. So that was just a, a wonderful experience. And she's contributed so much to, to our dog training knowledge. So that that was good. But yeah, I haven't ever tried do as I do. I think it sounds like a huge amount of fun to do with a dog. But I think this thing of not generalizing it just shows us how complicated learning is when it comes down to it you know and um, we it's a problem that people often have they expect their dog to pick things up very quickly well even if it's a basic thing but it usually takes longer than you think and it's just a slow process it it takes time these are biological beings we're not dealing with computers I mean, we complain enough about computers, though. You should say we should know we don't want our dogs to be like computers. But it is something I think that can be hard for people to learn that they do just have to slow things down and relax and, you know, not worry if the dog's not doing the thing that you've asked, but see it as a challenge and, and try and teach them and not expect things to generalize because it is hard. Um, one of the things that increasingly I'm sort of the more stuff I do on dog cognition, and as I said, the the more I'm starting to question, you know, how cognitive dogs are, and actually how cognitive most of us, we are as well. You know, I wonder how much of what we label as cognition is sort of post hoc explanations, you know, and maybe we're responding to much simpler rules. Um, and, you know, the, to me, what when I do the cognition, um, some of the cognition stuff, one of the things that always strikes me is just how observant dogs are, how sensitive dogs are to certain cues. And we mentioned about, you know, just change a small aspect of the environment. And you think, oh, you know, they've forgotten it. And no, it's just a different thing. And they're mm -hmm. making those um, different links. And yeah, we make the assumption that, yeah, you learn something and you can generalize it. Well, actually, you know, yeah that ability to generalize is actually an abstract process and that abstracting is not an easy thing to do you know mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yes humans can do it but that comes at enormous cost of mental health because we then start to worry about things that aren't going to happen or a very low probability <laughs> you know because we abstract and it's to me that's an area which i think is quite fascinating is the degree to which uh, yeah you know uh, animals are abstracting and what we often assume is a cognitive process so I was reading a paper the other day about you know the new Caledonian crows who have this mm. tool use um, so again for people who don't know that there, there's a group of crows in New Caledonia which is in the middle of nowhere that seem to be remarkably good at using sticks as tools and people have very much focused on their cognitive ability you know what what's special in their brain and an alternative perspective is to say actually it's the anatomy of new caledonian crows that is special they have a particular shape of beak and their eyes positioned in a certain way so that when they pick up a stick it acts like an extension of the beak mm. so it's not that they're thinking an awful lot it's just that it's very easy you know to view the stick as basically part of your beak. Mm. Therefore, you become good at tool use because your beak is a tool, you know, but you're not thinking it is a tool. You're just mm. extending your, your beak. And it's those sorts of simple rules. And you think, hmm, that's interesting. You know, here we are. And, you know, it's not, it's not a bit of the brain. It's actually the shape of the animal. And it's the shape mm. of the animal that affects its behavior and it just because it's got eyes that allow it to see its beak in a certain way when it puts a stick within it it in effect becomes an extension and we know you know a lot of this sort of um, stuff goes on that you know that with people that um, you know if you um, put extensions onto people etc they their brain processes it as if it is part of them um, mm. And it's that sort of translation and that sort of makes sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not demeaning dogs, but they're not probably as, I just wonder, they're not as smart and as we perhaps sometimes think they are. And because we think that they should be smart, that's where people get the unrealistic expectations. And that's why it's important to me is that, 
you know, it's a little bit like if you think that your dog has a moral sense, then, you, you know, that's how you justify telling him off for doing what he should know better. Mm. Well, if you accept that dogs don't have a moral sense of what's right and wrong, um, then actually you shouldn't be punishing them because they're, yes. <laughs> they're not capable of that. Likewise, if you think they've got certain cognitive abilities, you act towards them in a certain way. Whereas if you just see them as very perceptual, mm. and again, one of the nice examples I think of that is, you know, the puppy that chews the slipper and the person shows the dog the slipper, look what you've done. You think, <laughs> what a great example of stimulus enhancement. Next time you're alone, your dog's going to say, that slipper's really important. I'm going to go to it. Do yeah, you... and it's really fun because yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, my really person played chewing. with it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you showed me this is what I should be chewing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like the Gary Larson cartoon, you know, what dogs hear and what we say. You know? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I think probably a lot of cognition is embodied. And I'm going to give mm-hmm. you an example of people and language because what I did my PhD on a very long time ago was actually metaphor and how people use metaphor. And the thing about metaphor is that we tend to think of it as being a poetic device, um, you know, something that poets use or novelists use when they're being literary, coming up with these really beautiful phrases. But actually, it's a tool of thought. And some of the best ways those poetic devices work are when they're rooted in the metaphors that we use as everyday metaphors, like, for example, thinking of good things as being up, um, that kind of thing. So actually, there's this like whole set of metaphors that that we use which underlie some of the more poetic metaphors that we use and making sense of those metaphors is is really important so it's um i I guess it's it's an example of how actually we have this underlying thing and some of those metaphors are to do with our bodily experience as well so they seem to be embodied um in terms of what we think of as warm and what we think of as cold and the kinds of metaphors that that of, of what's warm and what's cold so that's just kind of a a Fascinating. Now, tell me more. Human example. I'm, 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 this, is, I think this is fascinating. Because, yeah, as you say, it, embodied cognition, um, again, I think is something that, um, yeah, we perhaps don't talk enough about. Um, and as you say, the, using these sorts of rules, um, and I sometimes talk about, you know, yeah, the, the, the association. So you draw a sort of star shape on the board and a sort of wiggly thing so those people who are just listening to it and can't see it they can't see what my fingers are doing a load of wiggles <laughs> an like thing and you say which of these is the splick and everybody says the star-shaped one you know yeah and you we have those natural associations so no i'm, I'm intrigued to do so so you're saying about up and being positive because yes with dogs you know there's the I, I don't know whether this is relevant this may be completely irrelevant but I'm just thinking of the work, you know, that to speed animals up, we naturally use raising tones, you know, yip, 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 or things yep. like that. And if you want to slow it down, it's whoa, and descending tones, lower pitch tones. And that goes across cultures. Mm. And I've always sort of said to the students, well, you know, there are these sorts of predispositions in, in the brain. I'm not sure why. Um, but yeah, why do we call a lemon, the taste of a lemon sharp and a knife sharp? Mm. yeah and 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 so it's these embodied cognitive cognitive experiences I think but we have to be really careful when we're talking about what goes across cultures or across languages because so much work is done on English and we can't assume that other languages are the same and I guess color terminology is the obvious one that most people know about that other languages have different words for colors but if you speak other languages then you you have a different way of of thinking about the world when you're speaking that language to some extent so this is moving away from dogs probably a bit too far (laughs) but um, I think it it, it's really fascinating stuff and so to bring it back to dogs what I do now when I'm writing about pets is I have this background in how people talk about things and communication and also in quite close observation of some of the language that people use and so I'm trying to use those principles when writing about what people should do or help people understand something about 
science and what science tells us about dogs. So I, I think there's a whole load of communication strategies that, that we can use that are helpful in getting a message across. And that's not to say I get it right all the time. I'm sure I make lots of mistakes, but you know, it's it's one of the things that I like doing and that I like teaching to my students at Kinesius as well about some of the principles of talking about talking about things and how to get messages across and how to make things vivid and memorable and so on. Now that's what you need. That's that's a book in its own right getting messages across in that way, you know, because we do talk, I mean, and we, we talk with our students about, you know, how you phrase things and how you, you know, um, communicate, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm self-taught in that. You've got a PhD in it, for goodness sake. You need to, you need to write the, these articles. So that, <laughs> yeah, it would be fun. <laughs> um, yeah, if, I, if only there was enough time though, that's always yeah. the trouble. <laughs> So it has to be enough time to write as well as enough time for training the dogs. <laughs> well, that does explain things like your book and your blog as well, because as I said, they are they are remarkable in yeah the, the language that you use and to hear you say that. I think, OK, so this isn't just your no disrespect. This isn't just your natural style. This is actually you being very smart. Actually, you, you have <laughs> thought a lot about. And I, I remember chatting to John Bradshaw and I must do, do one of these with John. Um, but, you know, he said to me, you know, when he wrote in defense of dogs, you know, the editor kept coming, you know, basically, the, yeah, it wasn't the content, but it was the delivery. And that's what a really good editor does in that, mm. area, you know, is they, they get you to express it in a way and they understand these things um, from whether it be just from a practical editorial point of view or whether it be from a scientific point of view where you're coming at it from yeah I think a good editor is wonderful because they understand what you're trying to do and they don't try and do it for you but they try and help you to do it even better so they point out the places where you could improve it and make it better and then they leave you to figure out how you're actually going to do that and it can make a big difference to helping you pull an argument together or, or you know pull something together or illustrate something better and yeah I think you know <clears throat> you write a book everyone thinks it's just your work but there's a whole lot of work that happens behind the scenes and that the editors are really important too <laughs> well yeah you know and there's there's um yeah it's it's writing a book and it's as I said it's getting that message across and it's it's making it a joy to read as I said that's I, I, obviously you know well, if you saw my downstairs office, I have loads of books, but this yeah, I really did enjoy reading because it, it's got that mix between both the science, but also, as I said, it's that personal story as well. Um, I, I, you, yeah, you see your journey there as well. Um, Thank you. And I am actually a very private person. So for me to write stories down about, even though it's it's about my dogs, but I mean, it's about me too. And just put that out with the world. I was so nervous before this book was published. And it a book is a slow process. So it was already and finished for quite a while before it actually got published, unfortunately, just as lockdown was happening at the start of pandemic and everything. But so I was really, really nervous. And it's been really nice for me to see how well it's been received and to have people write to me and say it's helped them understand their dog better. And, and that's what it's all about that, that, you know, I'm really grateful to those people for writing to me because it, it, it mm -hmm. you well, know, that's why I wrote it. I have a niece in Denmark, and she contacted, um, well, she's contacted me and my wife and said she's thinking about getting a dog probably next year or something like that were there any books I would recommend and um I will be recommending this one because I think this is exactly the sort of thing that she should be reading because she said you know she has grown up with dogs but she just wants to understand and, and I think yeah it's yeah it, it, it's not just a doggy book and I would recommend it to anybody who's thinking about getting a dog and, and people who have experienced it say I got a little bit of experience with dogs and I really enjoy it. I think you have. Well. So, <laughs> um, but so as I said, the sequel, which is the, going to be the cat one, but one thing that intrigued me because, um, you know, when, when I do these, I often ask people to send me a, a brief CV and bio, but one thing jumped out on your bio <laughs> that I wanted to ask you about because you, you put your select presentations and I just love the title of this. So if you can remember what you said, what dog trainers need to know about cat behavior? 
was like, oh yeah what a great title for a talk <laughs> yeah so i did that that was a talk for a conference organized by the bcspca who are a wonderful organization mm -hmm. and and actually we were talking earlier about regulating dog trainers they can't regulate them but they do have a scheme called animal kind which make sure that all the trainers in that use the right kinds of methods and so on so they also had these conferences um animal behavior science symposium really nice conferences because it involved a mix of people from vets as well as dog trainers and shelter staff and a few cat behavior people so you know a really good mix of people who care about animals and i just went and talked because dog trainers do go to houses where people have cats they have to take cases on where you know there's a dog cat issue and it helps if they know something about cats so it was just like a basic introduction to what you should know about cats like what the five pillars are how to understand cat body language and so on it was actually a really fun presentation to do i enjoyed that one a lot yeah no i mean we, we yeah we obviously we tend to teach cat behavior we teach dog behavior and i just i just love the sort of yeah yeah dog trainers do need to know about it as well i thought it was really neat yeah <laughs> as i said you you have a i mean yeah you do have a real gift with words i think um you know I thank think, you um yeah just whether it be that i mean and some of your other debunk support science or tell a story how to communicate about dog training and animal welfare that is a webinar i'd like to if it's, if it's still yeah I, 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 and that was about science communication and, and how dog trainers can use some of the principles of science communication so for example when it says i said it is important to be able to debunk messages because you hear a lot in the media about how it doesn't work um and I didn't explain that very well. I should have followed my own advice and said you erroneously hear in the media a lot of the time that it doesn't work, but it does. It can work, but it sometimes doesn't. And I think one of the things that people often think is that if someone is the expert, they just need to provide the information and the other person will take it in. But you have to take account of who you're talking to and what they already know. It's not like they have a big hole in their brain that you're going to fill with information. There's already stuff there and they already have their own ideas there and you need to present your message in such a way that takes account of those ideas and helps them to understand why these other ideas are better instead and specifically if you're trying to debunk something you also need to give a lot of information you want to make your message memorable and vivid so telling stories is a great way to do that um, and at the same time you want to make sure they have a lot to think about because you want them to be putting we're back to cognition you want them to be putting their cognitive effort into processing the message the right kind of message um, rather than the wrong one so this is one of the reasons i prefer to spend more time talking about the advantages of using reward-based methods and how you should use positive reinforcement and you need to get your timing right and you need to have the right kind of treat to give your dog if you're using food as rewards and what kinds of food work in different circumstances, because that gives people a lot of solid information and a lot to think about. And you're pushing out, to use a metaphor, some of the stuff about aversive methods or erroneously being the alpha or whatever people think instead. So you can't just assume that if you say something, people are going to listen, especially at the moment that because there are so many messages from so many different places. If you want your, your message to get across, it needs to stand out and it needs to be thorough and detailed so um that's one of the things that i said in in that webinar um just but talking about you, debunking um you know I'll, I'll always have a go anyway and, and that was done for the pet professional guild two years yeah. ago do you think they've still got a copy do you think they'd be willing to make it open access because i think it's such an important message that if more people appreciate that then we can be getting the more people can be getting their message across in a more appropriate way well, I probably would update it now because I, I teach a course at Kinesius about communicating anthrozoology, which is a, a five week course. It's mainly about writing. I do talk about podcasts. I did this time have them listen to one of your podcasts, actually, um, which was fun. I'm not sure <laughs> no, it was really novel. fun because <laughs> most of it was about writing and how to how to get messages across in writing. But I wanted to give them a couple of examples of of different styles of podcasts so I gave them one of yours to listen to and I also gave them another one to listen to that had a very different set it's very organized different set of production values it's more like a radio show rather than just a normal chat and 
they preferred the chat to be honest <laughs> so there you go <laughs> which is why i'm not naming the other thing that they listened to um but but they did like the chat because it felt more personable i think and was easier for them to relate to whereas anyway started during lockdown simply because i, I mean pre-lockdown i was probably out of the country once a, at least once a month on business um and i was away from the university probably on average at least a, a day a week and I don't know you know I, I guess I sort of missed meeting up with some of these people and I thought and I also gave one of, one of the lectures I gave to the um, students and I said something about sort of Vicky Voigt and the students just looked at me completely blank and I was thinking they don't know who Vicky Voigt is and okay Vicky doesn't publish an awful lot now but she is still in academia and she is the person who really put together the first of these protocols in a meaningful way. And, you know, everybody sort of talks about them, and but they've given up putting, you know, Voith and Borschelt afterwards, you know, as a reference <laughs> in the yeah. scientific field. And you think, and I, and I was thinking, well, you know, she's, I mean, she's, she is still there, but she, she sort of could have retired a long time ago. And I thought, I think it'd be really nice to just catch up. I've been so lucky in my career with the people that I've bumped into and for whatever reason, they haven't shut the door in my face. You know, um, they've, they've not only let me in, they've put me up for the night and, you know, and I've kept in touch with these people. And I thought, I, I, and this was the idea behind these initially was I just want to have some of these chats with some of these people because people aren't going to know about them. Um, they may not be as prolific in their production and whatever, but here's a way of capturing some of this. And actually, just this week, Don Broom has agreed to do one. Which I'm really awesome. thrilled with because I love Don, and mm. Don was actually my PhD examiner. And um, oh. had interesting discussion. I had to have two externals because it was a staff oh. PhD. So yeah. I had double joy. But we, we, you know, um, and. I have no idea how it's going to go. I mean, I, I, I love Don and we can we can chat about all sorts, but, you know, and we can agree to disagree. Um, he, he's always fascinating to listen to. I just think, yeah, you know, he's, okay, he's an emeritus professor now and people do still know of him, but it, it won't be too long before they don't. And you just think, yeah, actually, you need to know who are the real pioneers here. And, you know, I, I would say, you know, you're, you're a pioneer in this communication side of things. You're yeah. somebody who, well, not only does it well, but you know why you're doing it well as well, I think, because you, you, you've really illustrated Thank that you. sort of things that, um, and I, I just, you know, and I just love just catching up with people. Um, mm. I enjoy teaching because a lot of the time I'm learning from the students as well. Mm. I, I that's the thing I really love about teaching is that you do learn so much from your your students I think it's really nice students always look really surprised when you tell them that <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's careful, you know, like, why, why aren't you paying us a fee <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. well, I, I think it's a little bit more but mm. um but yeah I, I that's I I love our master's program for that reason um mm. you know you've got students you've got a relatively small group of students there's an exchange and we we say to them you know Yes, I've got 30 years experience in this field since I qualified and a bit more actually. But, you know, there's 30 of you here and you've all got much more diverse experience. You know, I've been in academia now for, well, more than 25 of those years. So, but you know, you've worked in a shelter in the last, well, you work for this rescue organization, you work for this, charity that trains assistance dogs you're a vet in practice you know bring that together and let's see and, and, and then they say well what about this you know, oh, I haven't encountered that let's think about it and work it through and it is you know that is it's it is great um, when you get that opportunity um, to... so I don't teach so much nowadays but that's what I love about the Kinesius Masters program as well because the students come from a range of different backgrounds and they all bring something different and it makes them so interesting to talk to you know um i, I think it's really good so so you sort of um um sort of said a little bit about you started the blog but i mean what i mean you, you said you you read john bradshaw's book 
Uh, I didn't realise that that was because the blog started in 2012, am I right? Yes, and his yeah. book came 2011 in the UK, I think, wasn't oh, you it? You didn't hang around, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he obviously inspired you fairly quickly, but you know, but you must have. Well, maybe you didn't. Maybe like me, you just did it on, <laughs> on a whim. I just so, did it. I I, yeah. I I did just do it on a whim. I I actually, to begin with, I didn't put my name on it because I didn't know if I was going to keep writing it. You know, and if I was going to stop three months down the line, I didn't want to leave my name attached to it. But then I kept writing it and I kept enjoying writing it and people kept reading it as well, which was very nice. So it, it kind of became quite reinforcing from that point of view. And then writing WAG took, I mean, I spent years writing WAG. It, it actually took me about five years to write the book. <laughs> um, really, it was it was a long time. Um, so I was doing that in the background for some of the time. So, yeah, and it's just been it's been a real pleasure to do it and fun and when I don't have enough time to write blog posts I actually get frustrated sometimes like I see these days it, to begin with it would sometimes be I would be quite choosy about what I am choosy about what I write about but to begin with sometimes it would actually be quite hard to find things I wanted to write about because it was a much smaller field and if I was just wanting what was brand new there was less to choose from that's not to say there weren't lots of good things to choose from but given it's got quite a specific kind of focus whereas now there's so much that I would like to write about and I don't have the time to write about and really great pieces of science that I just haven't had time to cover and I wish I did and I find that quite frustrating um, but there you go <laughs> you know it's just just how it is that's partly why I started the positive post which is my new newsletter because I in that as it's like a little email magazine, but part of it includes short summaries of several scientific articles before it gets on to the other kinds of things that are in there. So that means that I am at least covering a few more things for, for the people who sign up to that. But I, I partly am choosy because I, if I don't enjoy writing takedowns of things, like it's very, sometimes it can be very easy to do a takedown of an article, but, mm. but I don't find that helpful. It's not helpful to people, ordinary pet owners reading my blog because it, it just makes them see science, misunderstand science, I think, as a field. I think people, ordinary people don't really understand the types of criticisms that you might do and the fact that no like you said earlier that no experiment is absolutely perfect so I prefer to write about things where I really like the study and it's a really well designed study or it's got something really interesting but unfortunately these days there are lots of papers like that that I haven't been able to cover and yeah I, I wish I had more time for it but there are only so many hours in the day. Okay so let's so yeah and I think that's um and then just thinking about that, you know, you say the put down. Yeah, because I think if you start on that negative, then you people immediately become that tribal, don't they? Sort of mm -hmm. if you're being negative, then, OK, if I don't if, if I agree with you, then great. But if I don't, well, you're just you're just bitter about it. Whereas mm -hmm. actually saying, you know, yeah, here's an idea. Here, here's the thing. And, and, and yeah, I think that's a really neat um, take on it um, that, yeah, selling that positive and um you know as scientists yes we do look for what what else might explain the results and look to um i mean the big debate at the moment uh, that uh, or to me one of the big debates is what exactly is the nature of the relationship between owners mm -hmm. and um cats I, I i still um don't think that attachment is a good model in that context in, in the original bulbian sense Mm. attachment um i think it's a much more complex emotional uh relationship i and there's a and i'm aware there's you know not only our own work but increasingly we're seeing it in other pieces of work that the relationship from the cat's perspective is seems to be or the cat's behavioral style with the owner is very heavily influenced by reinforcement and the way that I think about it is that, you know, from a dog's point of view, and as I said, you've got to be careful with the generalizations, but we'll take the stereotype, yeah? Dog is a social species, therefore intrinsic to dogs and their relationships with humans is that emotional connection, which serves the purpose of we're better together. You know, that is at the heart. Dogs are looking to be with others, certain others in order to be better together. And that's sort of what shapes things. In the case of the cat, you can have cats that socially bond absolutely, and you know, and I'm not saying that you you can't, but in a lot 
you know, cats are pretty well equipped to look after themselves defensively. Um, mm -hmm. so they do not depend on the owners for that protection and whatever. So that immediately calls into question whether or not attachment is a good model. Um, and um, they are that much more independent. So to them, it's more of an alliance maybe and that and and the relationship of what you see seems to be much more heavily so when you use food you will get reinforcement of the behavior perhaps less than the um you know creating the emotional relationship in that way so when you know things like separation related problems in cats a lot of that you know as far as we can tell is much more related to frustration mm. um, and it's that simple frustration that i can't have what i want when i want now and i've lost control of the situation as opposed to i'm you know uh, i'm missing you i want to be with you which i think is perhaps the you know it's somewhat anthropomorphic but it's you know but to just clarify the difference in the sort of processes that are going on in dogs heads compared to cat heads in those situations although they might behaviorally look similar they actually i think have a different emotional basis but you're going yeah. to say yeah i i i think we don't really have enough evidence yet and cats have such a wide spectrum of social behaviors actually and also for the cats that live entirely indoors their person probably actually is a lot more important to them and they can't although they may be equipped to go and hunt a mouse for example they can't actually go and do so unless you're unfortunate enough to have mice in your house so they do rely on you um and um yeah so i think it probably depends a bit on the cat and the kind of background they've had because obviously some cats don't need people at all yeah. um, but if a cat has grown up in an indoors only home and they've got always got people around them and relied on people for things um I think they maybe they do i don't know i think i mean i agree with you so when we uh, we've recently published a paper on relationships between owners and their cats and we identified five types and there was the emotionally codependent and you know what's in, been interesting is you know when you publish a paper on there are five profiles of cats and their owners you can guarantee it's going to go global <laughs> you know yes. <laughs> look at and the university set up this um actually the, they, there is an online version of the quiz that you can do and you I saw it. it yeah and you know people have done it all over the world and i've had lots of emails and messages from people saying this is spot on you know this does describe it. I think, well okay it, it seems to be working in bolivia and where else you know these people so mm. that's encouraging what i'm interested in now is yeah now we've got these five types what else does that tell us about the behavior of the animals yeah and how are they as you say are the ones that are perhaps the emotionally codependent, are they, yeah, that much more attached in that mm -hmm. sense? My, and, you know, future work will start to tease that out. My, but I, I think the, the important thing is, what it suggests is that simple attachment is not, is not as universal as it is with dogs. And we, we do know that, that that attachment model doesn't work with all dogs, but, mm -hmm. it, you know, it does describe an awful lot of, the relationships whereas with cats it's much more diverse the interesting thing when we did the original study which questioned whether or not cats were truly attached and again i just want to emphasize we're not saying cats don't have an emotional bond we're talking about it in a, a very limited sense i've never had as much vitriol as when we published that paper actually i <laughs> i'll bet <laughs> I people say, i've just inherited a fortune i'm going to spend it ruining it how dare you say cat my cat doesn't love me and that's not all we said but as I said, we're looking at attachment in that narrow sense. We actually look to recruit as part of the population cats who owners thought were hyper attached, which would I would now say would be these emotionally codependent types. And they were not using anything that we could see as a substitute for the owner in their absence. So they weren't mm -hmm. seeking out that. Um, and that's, as I said, when we did the test, the only behavioral measures that we got could be explained much more um, in a much more straightforward way as simply the cat is frustrated. It's mm. not an onus, you know, for an attachment bond to exist, then the cat has got to particularly want that individual. He's got to discriminate that individual from anybody. And that's mm. the bit and the stuff that I mean, know, and I'm, I'm, I'm enormous respect for people like Monique O'Dell and their work. Um, but 
she's saying, oh, well, we've got this test in humans and you don't need a stranger. Well, I'm sorry, but unless you can show me that the cat is distinguishing between the owner and the stranger, you can't, to me, you can't convince me at the moment that that's truly an attachment just because it mm. shows these, this style of behavior towards the owner because there's so many other explanations. But, but that's, you know, that's sort of the, the joy of science as well, that we'll, we'll make progress. We're, I'm sure we're both wrong. <laughs> to very well, it'll, it'll get figured out I mean that's the nice thing about science isn't it you, you learn so much all the time and things get get figured out and that that quiz I shared that quiz on my blog page and it was really really popular people enjoyed doing it so <laughs> yeah actually yeah. as I said just before I did this I was doing a thing for the university for a student recruitment thing and they said to me that in the two weeks after that paper came out 90% of the traffic to the university was to that quiz. That we wow. <laughs> this afternoon. It was just like, you know, well, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I, but it worked there with thousands and thousands of hits. On it. So what a great example of science communication and, and doing something that people will engage with and find interesting. You know, I mean, it's, it's funny that that some I, th I think the quizzes often are the kinds of things that people like to do so yeah that's, well, that's I just, brilliant I, I, I sort of it took a little bit because um the and it sort of had the paper coming out and I just thought this is the sort of thing that you know yeah, the public are gonna like so um so I spoke to the press office and I said look it would be great if we could develop this little quiz and they said yeah we, we can we can do that um and as you say, it, it does engage people with it. Um, and there is a, a sensible, uh, a serious message behind it as well. And, you know, if we can understand the, the diversity of the relationships, then, you know, as I said, hopefully we can care for our cats as well as our dogs that much better. Mm. But, but anyway, I want, what I wanted to do is actually go pre John Bradshaw, because you sort of gave me, well, John Bradshaw, and then I did this. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, but what's your background with dogs and cats and etc you know have, have you always been no um so I've always loved cats I was not a dog person at all uh, as a kid actually I was terrified of dogs like really terrified um I had a few bad experiences with dogs I wasn't actually bitten but I had some scary experiences with dogs running up barking growling etc when I was really quite small and I was just terrified of them um but I love cats but I wasn't able to have a pet um as a kid so I enjoyed visiting family members like my grandparents had two cats um and so I I and we visited other people with animals and, and I enjoyed that but I was really really scared of dogs and it took me a long time to realize that actually dogs could be friends they didn't have to be terrifying um I kind of I kind of did desensitization and counter conditioning on myself when mm -hmm. I was a PhD student <laughs> because obviously being terrified of dogs is quite a disadvantage like I, I really like some people are afraid of spiders I was I, I was afraid of dogs um but because we lived near um I did my PhD at Nottingham and we lived near Woolerton Hall which is a really lovely hall with a deer park mm -hmm. and I wanted to be able to go running in there on my own and I thought well there were always lots of off-leash off dogs in there I didn't mind if a dog was on a leash because I knew it wasn't going to come up and bite me but if it was off-leash I was a bit afraid but I told myself well there are deer in this park they have to be good dogs because otherwise they'd be busy attacking the deer so they're not going to come and attack me and I really started paying a lot more attention to dogs and to their body language so that I began to be able to tell if I looked at a dog if it was friendly or not which I think everybody else grows up knowing already but I didn't I just was because I was so afraid of them so <laughs> it took me a long time to get over that and then eventually I did I did get over it and we actually we looked after a neighbor's dog when she went on holiday and the dog was a bit afraid of us. And in a way that helped me as well, because I could tell that the dog was afraid. And I don't know, it, it somehow it just helped me to be less, less concerned and less afraid because I, I had this caregiving responsibility, I suppose. And then I realized that I would like a dog, but I was traveling a lot, working long hours. I couldn't possibly, I knew I couldn't, but I really wanted, I, I really wanted a Siberian Husky. Um, and it was only after we come to Canada, we came to Canada, so I first came to Vancouver in 93 and th for a conference and thought this would be a really nice place to live and then there came a point when my husband's company uh, was bought up by a Canadian company with an office in Vancouver so he had the opportunity to, to 
basically just to transfer his job to Vancouver. And we were like, yes, go for it. So that was really, really lucky. And then finally, um, I was spending writing, no longer doing this job with all these other things to do. And we could get a dog. So we got Ghost. Ghost actually was my first first ever dog of my own. I, um, and I guess that's partly what motiv motivated me to keep learning about them, because I'd already been through this long journey of discovering that dogs actually could be friends. Um, whereas cats, I'd always liked cats and always been a cat person. So I have one dog and two cats now because Bodger passed. I've got a, a, a little senior Shih Tzu called Pepper and two cats, Melina and Harley. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, and I, I, well, yeah, I don't think it is any coincidence. As you said, you had to study dogs before you learned to love dogs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I often tell the story that I'm, I'm the youngest of five kids and my two brothers were born first. Then the next two years, my two sisters arrived. Then there was a bit of a gap and then there was me and I had the dogs. My mum said, yeah, I was just with the, I was just with the dogs. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> Uh, with you know five kids under the age of six which is what we were you know there's only an extra years yeah. gap. um you know my mum had to we had to entertain ourselves and, and my and I had to learn to be safe around the dogs and the dog that I was closest to was Amber and unfortunately she ended up being put to sleep because she bit somebody but oh, I'm not, sorry. You know, I used to you know she said you um, you used to ride that dog. You you taught yourself to get on a two-year-old. And I think, mm. well, okay, so I think, you know, and I think sort of being that youngest one, I was the I was always watching. Mm. Uh, and Ian Dunbar said the same, actually, with his introduction, you know, that he grew up on farms and whatever, and there was this um, farmhand and whatever. And it's that. And, yeah, so it is that learning to watch before you completely... Mm. immerse yourself in it I think maybe that there, there is something there you know there's... I think so yeah 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 I think so and the, the kinds of psychology that I did because it was paying close attention to language so that was using kind of observational skills as well so I think I think those of us who are good with animals are, are, are good at reading their body language so you have to pay a lot of attention to understand what's what's going on so I think watching and being good at observing I think is a it's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I've, I've just looked at the time. I didn't really move to some place. Wow. Well, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I will let you go. But just okay. So let's let's sort of run up hints and tips for people. What were the best bits of advice you think that for for people other than read your book? <laughs> <laughs> the main one that I always give is to avoid using punishment and use food to train your dog because. Um, food is a really good way to motivate your dog it's fun for you and your dog to train them that way it's effective and it doesn't have the risks of using aversive methods so that's probably the main one that I give to people yeah okay and sort of one thing that you wish you'd known earlier um well I wish I had known earlier that dogs could be friends because just think how many years I missed out on being friends with dogs you know <laughs> that's what I wish I'd known if I'd known how to read dogs body language earlier then at least I would have been able to tell the difference between the ones that were friendly and the ones that were a risk of biting me and I think that would have made quite a big difference to my life because there were even things I didn't go to because I knew there would be a dog there and I was scared you know as a kid when I was a kid because you know that's how that's that's what it was like but that, that gives you, you know, great empathy with both sides of the story. And I think that's really important that, you know, again, it's that we don't, you know, yeah, not everybody loves dogs. And mm. I, I have a colleague, the deputy head of school, and she, yeah, like you, she has a dog fear. And, mm. you know, she's happy to talk to me about dogs, etc. But, you know, and you just think, yeah. Um, and part of responsible ownership is to recognize that not everybody will love a dog. And, in order to get the you know in order for society to get the best out of the potential from having dogs in societies we do have to respect that yeah not everybody's going to love a dog um and so not just sort of well it's my dog i've got the right to do this and i think that's an important thing for people to uh, appreciate and clearly you, know, you can appreciate that given that you're scared of dogs 
Yeah, yeah. And even if people love dogs, there might be reasons why they don't want your dog to come running and jumping all over them. They might be a bit infirm. They might have just had surgery. They might be wearing their best clothes. You know, yeah. we do have to take account of other people as well as what our dog needs. Yeah. So, I think on that note, shall we end it there? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure to come and chat with you. Yeah, it's been lovely to thank see you. Um, and hopefully we'll catch up again before too long. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right, thank you. Bye now. Bye.